We're going to have our scripture reading, which I... Oh, yeah. You're good. You're good. Um, um, Becky is coming up to read our scripture. She'll be reading from Genesis 1 and also from 2 Corinthians 13, if you want to have your Bible out. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. God blessed them and said to them, Be fruitful and increase. Number, fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky, and over every living creature that moves on the ground. God saw all that he had made, and it was, so, <laughs> and it was very good. And there is evening, and there is morning, the sixth day. Examine yourself to see whether you are in faith. Test yourself. Do you not realize that Christ Jesus is in you? Unless, of course, you fail the test. And I trust that you have discovered that we have not failed the test, that we pray to God that you will do nothing wrong, not so the people will see that we have stood the test, but so you will do what is right, even though we may have seemed to fail. For we cannot do anything against the truth, but only for the truth. We are glad whenever we are weak, but you are strong, and our prayer is that you may be fully restored. This is why I write these things when I am absent, that when I come, I may not have to be harsh in my use of authority, the authority the Lord gave me for building you up, not for tearing you down. We'll be especially in 2 Corinthians if you want to have your Bible open uh, to that place. Sometimes when you're reading different things, it kind of opens up different things, in, at least in my mind, the way I think about the Bible. Uh, please join me in praying for this morning. God, I do pray that your grace would be upon us. I trust and actually believe it is, and that you are working your grace in our minds and our hearts in sometimes obvious ways and subtle ways to just invite us to be closer to you. So I thank you for a good morning, a morning where we have the story of baptism, we're claiming the songs, and we're also having warm fellowship. You deserve all the credit. Um, but as we talk about some of the pain in our world, I do pray your grace to be with us and that you would help us to see how this pain is the very reason you came to be with us, that you died for us, that you rose for us. This pain is something that you've called us to step into, that you would bring about healing in us and in others. So please lead us in that. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be holy and pleasing to you. Amen. I want to start with a subclaimer because what uh, I'll be talking about this morning is, um, is talking a little bit about abuse. It's talking a little bit about how harm has happened in society or in the church. And the reality is in a room like this, that there are people around us that have directly experienced what I'm going to talk about. So that can be triggering, that can be very difficult and heavy, and so I just want to let you know that, and I, um, I take us in this direction this morning because I think it's very important to talk about the real things of the world. You should show up at church and actually hear about the things that matter, and all the spiritual things we talk about every Sunday I do matter, but sometimes we need help connecting how these things can, our, impact our, our spiritual, emotional lives, all in society. Uh, we first read, heard from Genesis, and the reason I asked for that to read, we won't stay there for a long time, but I think it's so important to remember that when God created, bless you, <laughs> when God created, he wanted to bless. There you go. Um, when God created, he said that all that he created was good. Everything, everything that God created, he said it was good. The earth, the sky, and specifically what was read for us, the people created in his image, they were created good. The Hebrew word is tov. It's a really simple word. It's T-O-V, tov. And he created people in his likeness to bring about goodness in the world, not just to speak the idea of goodness. Yeah, that's good for now. But no, the totality of what he was creating was good. And then when he gave Adam and Eve the charge to go, be fruitful and multiply, he's giving him a, them a charge to spread and share God's goodness in the whole world. 
And so then when you go to the point where sin and brokenness end up, that Adam and Eve, they step away from what God's called them to, to seek out another hope, another dream, to maybe even to attempt to be God themselves. They are not only distorting all the amazing gifts that God's given them, they are distorting and obstructing that pathway for Tov. They are distorting God's goodness. And we see this in so many ways. It's what we preach about often, what we teach and discuss directly or not. And so one of the things I want to talk about, how this brokenness shows up. We're created for goodness in the world, and we're experiencing the crisis of failing leadership. We're experiencing the crisis of power being used to manipulate and exploit people time and time again. You could go through countless examples of how this happens in every time and place, every community around the world. It's not just unique to our own specific moment. And I I want to start by specifically focusing on how leaders represent that for us. When we have leaders in place and what we ask them to do, and you might have a few leaders that come to mind for you. Um, There was a person this past week who I had never heard of because I haven't lived in Canada more than three and a half years. But uh, Peter Nygaard was was indicted for allegations around sexual assault that were years in the making. And I used to know so little about this man, and maybe you know things about him or not, but he had such influence and ability and power that not only did he use that to harm other women, but he used it to protect himself. He used it to keep all the justice and judgment at bay so he could get away from being r- rightly indicted for crimes he committed. There's other leaders no comment. There's other leaders that represent this extreme abuse of power for their own benefit at the advantage and exploitation of others. Even like leaders, whether it's institutions, people we elect, we have people that we've asked to play a role in society. And regularly, we'll pray for people that in all these different respects, we will pray for leaders that we have serving. And the reason we do that is because what they do and how they lead matters. What they do and how they lead matters. It either hurts people or it blesses people. And it's that same power at work I just talked about in Adam and Eve. That same power is at work in the politician that goes into politics with good intentions, but then they're shaped by this culture that is corrupt, that you have to do this, to do this, to do this, a game that always intensifies my cynicism. And then at the very point, they're being, they're using the gifts that were created to bring about goodness in the world And instead, they're using it in destructive ways. The church is not exempt of this. The story extends beyond just people who might not identify as Christian to people who are pastors and other Christian leaders. This uh, person here is Carl Lentz. And it's part of a context of like celebrity Christian leader, which is something we live in now. Celebrity Christian leader that people can be given a platform so large to serve. He served with Hillsong that their character never was asked to grow with their platform. They're having influence and power well beyond their character and without systems of accountability around them. The next person, this is a younger picture of Mark Driscoll, who was really prominent and influential in planning of new churches some years ago. And his church had to call him to account for all the uses of power he was using and abusing power, harming other people. If you're interested in more about that, there was a really great podcast called The Rise and Fall of Mars Hill where they tell that story of how power, and what they emphasize in that is not just here's the person to blame. What they emphasize is that the church as a whole is responsible. The church as a whole is responsible for the ways we talk about power and try to use power to to get to a place that we can justify where it goes, to justify the means. And if, you know, if someone is a jerk, but they bring a lot of people to Jesus. Is that okay? I don't think God says yes to that. The other person that maybe this person was influential for you is all the news and reporting that came out about Ravi Zacharias. And these are people that have gifts. These are people that have influence. They have power. They have an ability to do something good in the world. 
And yet, there is a hidden story of crisis in their lives, spiritually, emotionally, socially, relationally. There is a hidden story underneath it all, and it's this crisis is what I want to talk about. I'm going to talk a little bit more about one more person. And it's a person that you might know or not is Bill Hybels. Bill Hybel served as a pastor at Willow Creek for over 40 years, was incredibly influential for the way church happens. I would even say some of the things we do here at Bethel were influenced by him and other leadership t- strategies that helped bolster the church and its mission. No question. But his church kept it in the dark, all these allegations of abuse for years that kept coming out of uh, misconduct with women in the place. Some sort of instances of possible sexual abuse happening related to him, and they quieted it at all. Until eventually he has to resign, and every single key pastoral leader and elder resigned as well. They admitted, we wronged the church by not letting the truth speak. And the reason I reflected on that story with Willow Creek and with Bill Hybels is because this week I was reading a book that's called A Church Called Tove. And it's a, it's a book that's Tove, so it's the goodness. The church is called for goodness. And it's trying to talk about these systems of secrecy that actually really impact the truth resounding in our, a community like what we have here, or a macro all the churches anywhere, how, what are the things that are happening that are harming the church and actually preventing us from sharing goodness? It's things like secrecy. It's the way lies hurt and harm people. And so sometimes, like what was done in that instance with the church, they push away the things that happened because this is going to hurt the church's witness. You know what also hurts the church's witness? Abuse. It devastates the church witness because all of a sudden you realize, what is, is this a sham? That people would be harmed and be silenced because we don't, we want, we don't want to unsully any particular person or organization. The truth should speak. It's co-authored by two people, Scott McKnight and Laura Berenger. And one of the things they say about the goal of their book is to talk about the redemptive value of the church, how they can do this, that that fallenness can be restored. And they say this, above all, this is a book of hope, a book of hope about a better way we're calling the circle of tov from the Hebrew word for good. And what it takes to form a culture of goodness in our churches that will resist abuses of power promote healing, and eradicate toxic fallout that infects so many Christian organizations. If you were not aware of how much abuse has happened in the world at large or even among Christians, I want you to be. Because we have to deal responsibly and faithfully and wisely with how this shapes our witness and how it shapes us. Because otherwise the crisis determines who we are. And so I asked us to reflect on 2 Corinthians 13. It's the very end of Paul's second letter to the church in Corinth. And I want to, the reason this is because he's talking about his goal that he's been trying to do with the church. And even he alludes to how he's been trying to use his own power and authority. And I want us to use that to reflect on how we are supposed to use our power and authority. A few verses before what was read for us, He says this, talking about planning to return and be with the church. He says this, On my return, I will not spare those who send earlier or any of the others, since you are demanding proof that Christ is speaking through me. What's really interesting that Paul is talking about in this letter and in other correspondences with the church is that they're questioning Paul's authority. They're questioning his power. They're saying, you know, there are other people that are basically saying, do you really want to follow Paul? And you know what their justification is that Paul's responding to? Paul comes across so humbly. Is that really a person of authority? Paul comes across meek and serves other people. Does he really have something to say? Why don't you listen to this other guy here who's louder, bolder, and even more confident? Shouldn't we listen to that person more? And so Paul's responding because he's dealing with the fact that the church is starting to doubt his authority in Christ because he's modeling power and authority like Jesus did. That's where I look at the story and I think, what's the story of power and authority in the world? 
Can you become the strongest version of yourself, the loudest version of yourself, and step into the world to grab as much attention as you get? Is that what power and authority is these days? And it shouldn't be. And so a church, like the church in Corinth, is experiencing a we experience. When we see a vacuum of leadership and where there's lots of different voices, sometimes you just naturally focus on the loudest one when you shouldn't. And so Paul is addressing them saying that even though he's so far away, he wants them to look to his example and talk about how they're having un, like wrong expectations of power and authority. They're even distancing themselves from Jesus, if you think about it. You know, people did that in the Gospels. They distanced themselves from Jesus because he didn't use his power and authority the way people wanted him to. So the very first thing, a couple points of this, these few verses, reading from verse 5. I'm going to read it again. Paul says this, examine yourselves to see whether you are in faith. Examine yourselves to see whether you're in faith. And he says, test, test yourselves. Do you not realize that Christ Jesus is in you? Unless, of course, you fail the test. So the first thing he says to the church, and it's good for us to step into that thinking, okay, examine myself. What am I examining myself about? Am I in faith? When I think about what I need for power and influence and change in my life, and am I operating in a place of faith? And then Paul talks about a test. He's saying, you're going to test yourselves. Now, he starts talking about a test, and then he follows it up really quickly saying, I am very confident you will pass this test. <laughs> and he, he's writing in a posture of support. I want to uphold you. I want to see you to the very end. You are not alone in this journey. I do not want these people to lead you astray. And so verse five, no, I'm going to, verse six, he talks about this. He says, be ready for the test that you don't fail. And then verse six, he says this, and I trust that you will discover that we, we have not failed the test. Now we pray to God that you will not do anything wrong. Not so people will see that we have stood the test, but so that you will do what is right. Even when we may seem to have failed. Paul's calling the church to examine the ways in which they are in faith and striving to meet the test that God's given them. And I think, what could that test be? The test of staying following Jesus in the midst of a, of a city and a community that would reject otherwise. A test of, do you really believe that Jesus is the ultimate source of authority? And this message that's fueling the apostles and the disciples teaching the good news is that message, the true word to lead people back to God and set people free. The test in some way is a measure of that. But then he goes forward, not just saying that, but he says, it's not just that you've lived the right way, but that you advocate for the right thing the right way justice to happen in this world. Christians should be the leaders of justice. Not just people that sometimes we tack it on because we think it sounds good. Like we need to lead in the way of justice. It's what we're called to, to bring about goodness in the world. And so he says this too. So I'm just reading verse by verse. So we read verse six, seven, read verse eight. For we cannot do anything against the truth but only for the truth. So for Paul, as a leader in this moment, and he's realizing they're in a church where they have difference of opinion, they have different religions in place, different practices of worship. There is all kinds of ways that there could be confusion, but he insists, stay on the truth. Follow Jesus. Learn about this way that is described and given to you. And we have to stay committed to the truth. And there's this connection, not something at odds, not intention, of both truth giving way to justice. Truth giving way to justice as a natural expression of faith. And so they are not at odds at all. And then he kind of closes in this section that he's talking about, not only just encouraging them to stay on the truth, before the truth. He says in verse 9, We are glad whenever we are weak, but you are strong. And our prayer is that you may be fully restored. This is why I write these things when I am absent. And then when I come, that I may not be harsh in my use of authority. Because the authority the Lord gave me for building you up, not for tearing you down. 
The function for Paul of power and authority is not to just tell everyone to be in line. That's not right. Just stay over there. The function of the authority and power that God's given for Paul is truth, but it's also to be expressed in weakness (laughs) through suffering and its goal is to be fully restored, to full, seek the full restoration of other people, the full restoration of other people, and that he doesn't use it to tear down, which you probably in your life have felt power and authority used to tear you down. Instead, the authority that God's given Paul is to build up. And so the reality that I I, I start off by thinking as I think about how to apply this passage for us is that misuse and abuse of power can take place anywhere and through anyone. That there is no place that is exempt. There's no person that's beyond this. And I want to make this simple because the examples I gave are, well, they're extreme. They're heavy. So the room, it feels heavy, right? But I mean... Power and authority are not just these significant things and not just leaders you might see like me on a stage here, three steps up. Three steps up is not that significant. No, it's things like I think about my power and authority as a father. I'm a dad. And so when it comes to talking about, you know, what's good and not good, I'm thinking about this every day with my son who doesn't really (laughs) want to do the things I asked him to do. And I have to ask myself, as a parent, I ask myself, do I want to use my power and authority as a parent to build up my son? Or do I kind of want to tear him down right now because he's, he's, he's being a little... Bleh. You know, it's the same way in, with friendships and in family. You all have influence and power. I, you might not think about this way, or maybe you never have, but you have influence and power. You know, that's one of the things that I think about, you know, as in, in the scope of us being fully restored as people in the kingdom, that Jesus' impetus is not to take away power from us. Jesus' impetus is to give us power. <laughs> you, I, I, you, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you and you will be my witnesses. His impetus is to give you power, <laughs> but to use it in a way that he uses power. That is what brings about full restoration. And so I think about, you know, I, I've been in a room, I've been in a room before, another church, where a church is being told that a beloved pastor has used their power and influence and deceived the church. I've been in a room like that. There is a rush of fear, anxiety, anger, confusion, of a pa- learning the story in whatever way is shared at that moment or in future days where a pastor has deceived people. He's abused his power. He's brought about harm. He's exploited his standards. And I think, wow, <laughs> this is a massive thing. And I've seen the hurt it causes people. As I imagine, if you've experienced anything like that, you've been deeply hurt. And then I think about, like even our church, I pastor this church. So I think about how I have boundaries and account ways that keep me accountable as a pastor. I'm accountable to our council of elders and deacons. I have a covenant that guides me in what I teach and what I preach. Things that guide me around conflict of interest or what I teach as a statement of faith. I have things in place, let alone mentors, let alone people that advise me that I respect their wisdom. But in the history of Bethel, If you know our history or know it well, it's not that abuse hasn't happened. It's in all the small ways and big ways that power is used to not build people up and tear them down. And the charge for the church, especially of leaders, but all people, is to use power graciously as God uses it. And so, I'm looking at how to apply apply this, and I think, well, we should better look to Jesus. Is that right? We should look to Jesus in this example of how he uses his power, how he instructs us to bring about goodness in the world. You know, Paul, in another letter, he talks about how in the scope of his ministry, that God's power is being made perfect in his weakness. As a pastor, I cling to those verses (laughs) because I feel totally inadequate and weak at times. And yet God is demonstrating his power to build me and others up in communion with the Spirit. 
And so Jesus' example of, I, I think a great example of how Jesus used his power is not him teaching in the synagogue, telling people of the kingdom of God is coming. He's using his power also when he's in the upper room washing the disciples' feet. Power in this way shows how it can bring about goodness and love and mercy through service. The problem when you see other people operating in power is it doesn't look like this. It looks like, look at me. Look at my platform. Can you build this platform up? Can we get a couple more steps? Look at what I want to do. And and there's not tension. There's not dialogue. There's there's not checks and balances. One of the things that um, is mentioned in the church called Tove book is this quote, the pastor's calling and the church's calling are to nurture people into Christiformity, to nurture people into Tove. God is good. Christ is good. And to be like Christ is to be Tove. And we have come full circle now, and the entire circle of Tove is swallowed up comprehensively and expressed by Christ's likeness. Is there that circle image? I was wondering if there's that circle image that could show. I don't know if it's there or not. Yeah, and part of it is that there should be this balance of all these ways that a culture is being shaped by goodness. Things we say, things we do, things that are taught that might come from me or another leader, and it flows from you, into you, through you, and brings about other teaching, other corrections, other steps towards the light and goodness. I think that's how it's supposed to work. Christ's example, I think, also really captures what he does on the cross. Not only serving people, you know, in the upper room, washing people's feet. Christ's example of power and authority looks like what's described in Philippians 2, which I want to read a part of it for us. Philippians 2. Am I going to get it really quickly here? All right. In your relationships, this is 2 verse 5. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who being in the very nature of God, do not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. So what do we do with this? You know, at first, I will not, I definitely want to apply this more personally with your life. Because as a leader, I reflect about this deeply. I, I thought a lot more about power and influence I might have as a pastor well before I ever became a pastor, because otherwise that's dangerous. It's like, hopping in a car without ever having driving lessons. That our role is to honor and respect and love other people, to allow them to have good boundaries and for me to keep my own boundaries. And I look to Jesus and I, and I just want to unpack a little bit of how I see power being used for good. And part of it is recognizing Christ first. That recon, recognizing Christ's ultimate authority and example and commit to follow him. Anything that I say after this will come about imperfectly and maybe not even make sense unless you have Jesus at the center guiding you to an understanding of how all things can be restored in him. But the first step after you do that is you, we must reckon, become aware of the power and influence in order that we have in order to use them faithfully. And what I mean by that is that you don't have to have a position of a structured authority to have power and influence in relationships. I've encountered people that are so, they're gifted for relationships that in any room they walk in, they operate with a lot of power and influence because they bring joy to a room. (laughs) They know people, they love people. That is influence and power. That can either be used to bring people closer to God, or that can be used to lead people away. People who are smart, intelligent, they have really good things to say. That can either be used to lead people close to God or lead them away. I have gave an example as a father. I, you know, I, I think about myself as a father, and I realize that I really want to use my personality, my gifts, to love my children and help them to know the love of Jesus. And while I'm so calm-mannered, they actually know when I'm not as (laughs) calm-mannered. And so the truth is that, especially in those places where I am tempted to use power 
for a quick fix to make something happen that I want to have happen apart from grace and love, there's parts of me that need to be reclaimed for Jesus. There's parts of me that are diving into that story of that fall in leadership. There's parts of me that are being teared away and causing harm to other people. And it's not what God wants. And so I want to distill this with three uses for power for good. <laughs> three uses that I think could apply to any pastor you interact with, any Christian leader, maybe even a non-Christian leader, and you could just make it known what you expect this person to do, even if they don't know who Christ is. So all of us can look at these things, and they will both help us to, under, to dissect if we think power is being used appropriately, or is it being used in a way that does bring about goodness. The first way is that power pursues and upholds truth. The first way, one of the most common ways that a power is abused in any situation or organization is when it, the veil of secrecy hits in, when there's a lack of transparency. And this is not, I don't mention this to basically like put on tons of guilt or blame on any organization that has fallen into the trap of not being as transparent as it needs to be. I'm more saying this, that this is the operating value that should always be the place. The strive for as much transparency as possibly possible and appropriate. Because this is what we do to uphold truth. To uphold the truth of what happened, you can't go and pursue the truth if you're concerned about the spin. You can't control the spin. I think about the Willow Creek example and all the ways I'm just re reading about it more because I didn't know much about it at the time, that they just did spin. Oh, we're going to tweak, tweak this a little bit. That's not actually quite what happened. Let's misrepresent this quote. Let's share this information, but not this information. Selective sharing and those kinds of things. Like that does not pursue and uphold truth. And if power is if being used that way, who is benefiting from that? Who benefits when the story is not told? That truth should be shared. And so I, 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 that, that's the first principle I would say, that if we are trusting that God in Christ can redeem and restore the way we use power and authority, the first thing on the list would be truth. Christ wants the truth to reign. The second one is that power protects others. It does not exploit or manipulate. And this is one of the ways that I truly believe that power is used wrongly. I don't want you to take away from this that, oh, Pastor Chris said that I have power and other people have power, but we probably just shouldn't use it that much. Wrong. We absolutely have to use our power. <laughs> Think about the people hurting around you. You've been given power and influence for a reason. To use it for the good and protection of other people, to advocate for justice, to not use that power and influence for good is to stand on the sidewise and watch people become harmed in ways that we should not support or encourage or any ways. You might not feel like you have the courage for it, but God is calling you to be courageous. He's calling you to be wise, to be loving, compassionate, to love justice and mercy and be about bringing it in the world. And so I, I think about my role in whatever way I have power and influence in our family, in whatever way I have power and influence in the church. And my role is to advocate and protect other people, which means that I, we have systems in place. I think about like our safe church pol policy that we have in place, which at times for our ministries can feel inconvenient, but it is absolutely necessary in a broken world that we have safe parameters. And then even still, I was talking with another person this week. You have all those things. If someone came in wanting to cause harm, they wouldn't know how to get around any system you threw at them. So instead of just having policies, what we have to have is a culture, a culture built on goodness for goodness and for protecting people. It's necessary. And I, and I hate that, but you, you can see lots of examples, and you personally probably have examples where you've seen people exploited and manipulated and harmed. I think about this with Jesus, that it's so counter. If your goal is to serve other people, then you're not trying to see what you get out of them. To actually serve people, to love them, to bless them, you are orienting towards how you can support them and not what you can receive from that. That's one of the things of power people use. Maybe with good intentions at first, but eventually it doesn't become about the others. It becomes about them. 
The last thing I'll mention is this, and Paul directly mentions this in 2 Corinthians, and it's that he is coming and he realizes there's some stuff he's going to have to talk about when he visits. He's realizing that his power and authority has been questioned. I mean, he's been probably slandered in front of the whole church and not been there. And he's coming and saying, like, I want to build you up. Like he's knowing I have authority in God's kingdom. God's called me to do this work. And as I come to you, I am prepared to use that, not to be harsh with you, but to build you up, not to tear you down. And I think about this because that's the important role of power. If you have influence in anywhere, your job, your family, in this church, use the influence to build other people's up. You build people up, love people, encourage people, affirm people's gifts, affirm people's callings. Say, I know you have difficult things and you discount yourself, but God loves you. It's so clear. It's coming through your life. So step into the goodness. What do you want to do? How can you share that goodness with other people? We are called to encourage each other, affirm, show the value that God has for each other by valuing each other. That is the full restoration or what Paul talks about as the ministry of reconciliation. To be committed to completely build up others that they would be healed and redeemed and experience the full measure and range of God's goodness. And so that's what I think about for myself. And any sort of difficult exchange of power, maybe I'm duking it off with my son who doesn't want to do what we're doing. And I think like, I want to build you up. And I don't always know how to do it. But at my very core, I want to build you up. I want to see you whole and experience the full goodness. And you, we might not always know specifically what to do in every situation, but you go into it with this posture of using your influence and power in this way. It'll lead you stepping into the stream of goodness. And perhaps you can just keep it going on, supporting it and encouraging it keeping, just insisting that truth needs to be spoken, insisting that, you know, I, that, that other people, individuals need to be protected, and insisting that we need to do whatever we can to build up others. Those are the three points which can be put up, that, that when you think about using our power, we have a lot of influence. I think the worst thing would be is we don't use our influence. Go from this place to use your influence, please. Use it for goodness. Use it for mercy and love. Build up other people because you were given it for a reason. So use it well. I'd like to invite our worship team up to kind of help us to respond in worship. And while I do that, I want to pray because the truth is that this is very difficult. So much of what I listen to and read are these stories of how power has gone awry and harmed and hurt people. And it's so, easy, it's so easy to become cynical and say, what is this institution? What is this? And I check myself. And the reason I check myself is not because I don't think what they're telling me isn't true. That, oh, that person really did do that. Or those, that organization, that really happened there. No, what I check myself is that I am not going to put parameters on how God is going to show his goodness to the world that I believe that he's called his church as broken, as imperfect as it is, to be the vessel through which goodness can come out to the world. And yeah, it can change. It will change for the better. As the more and more the church receives and welcomes God's goodness. But I'm not going to discount God's cho chosen means to choose to work through the church to bring about goodness. Instead, I'm going to stand in. I'm going to build it up. I'm going to do whatever I can to use it for the good of others and also so that God can be praised. So please pray with me. I want to pray about this. Lord, it feels like we stand in such a gap from the point in which you created us and called us good, even very good, to where things sit now, where we personally experience harm, where we know all the stories of leaders who do corrupt things, and just people who use power for corrupt reasons. And Lord, what we ask is the strength. We ask for the boldness, the confidence in you to use power and influence in a way that is intended to be used. 
that your name would be heard throughout all the nations, but that people would be restored, people would be redeemed, people would be loved, people would be built up and not torn down, and that we would do everything we can with our influence to protect other people. Because we want to get people to your goodness. And we don't step into the difficult pain apart from you. We step into it knowing your goodness has sent us there. Lord, I just ask as we look at Jesus' example of power and authority, that you would challenge us, you would empower us, and that you would lead us to walk in his example. And it's because you love us, because you desire for people to be reunited so there would be no more pain and suffering. So Lord, I just pray you would help us to claim the goodness, not with cynicism, but with hope that you do want to rebuild the church and lead it to full restoration. You want the church and for the people of God to be a shining light and a beacon of your goodness. And so Lord, today we say we are willing to be. Please lead us. Help us, especially those of us who feel especially wounded, that as we step in faith with you, you are with us, that your comfort and grace are with us. Lead us in worship. Lead us in praise. And I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.